What's up, squadron? Aviation has given me a ton of amazing experiences. Good, good job there. Nice rock, Highway. <laughs> but more importantly, it's introduced me to a whole new family of friends. Like, dude, you're killing it. You're having a great day. I just never give up. Airport, and then, oh, by the way, I got car ice while I was flying through, so the engine started running rough. I had to go. Join us tonight as we're clear direct for some hangar flying. I am Ryan Dabrowski, and this is Super Aero Live. I was so loud. I don't know. I'm even loud. What's up, Av Geeks? It's Wednesday, which can only mean one thing. It's time for another episode of Super Arrow Live. And I'm looking at the audio levels. They are a little hot, and I apologize for that. But you don't care, probably. Uh... Wow, it's been what a crazy couple weeks on the show. We had Bruno last week. We had Greg from Vans Aircraft the week before. Uh, we've got some guests coming up that I'm pretty excited about in the coming weeks, too. Everybody, if you could do me a huge solid, because it was my birth. I didn't even talk about it last week. Last week was my birthday. If you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button for my belated birthday. Like, two-thirds of you haven't subscribed to the show, and that breaks my heart in twain. So uh, would love to have you <laughs> subscribe, share it, like it, all that jazz. Someone always hits a thumbs down with, when the show is scheduled and then thumbs up at the beginning. I don't know who you are, but thanks for switching it back. Uh, Got to say hi to a couple friends in the chat here. Red Baron Modeling's here. Red Baron Modeling, by the way, I got to tell you, man, let's talk in the app. So Patreon, he's a, a Patreon Super Aero Squad member. We do a Zoom chat after the show, if you haven't heard me talk about it before. And we're going to talk about tonight. I ordered some 3D printed airplane models th from France. And we're going to talk about that tonight. He's going to help me out with those. Zach Sherman's here. Waukesha Pilot here. Ken Dotson. Haven't seen you in a while in the chat. Great to see you. Hanger Tales is here working on his book. 72 Papa's here. James Hyatt's here complaining that we were a few minutes late. Sorry, guys. I have kids and sometimes they are a pain in the butt and they don't want to go to sleep. And so that's uh, that's what happens uh when i tell my employees 30 minutes earlier than i need to so they are there when i need them dude you're you're giving me you're busting me a little too hard tonight steph strickland the incomparable steph strickland is here uh freedom fixers here i could go on and on and on and on the gang is all here mike's here he says you can start now i'm here well let's get started everyone Coming from, I don't even know where she's coming from. I want to tell a story real quick, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put her on the screen. I'm gonna tell a story how I met this amazing person. <laughs> Beth Stanton's here. Hey there, Ryan. <laughs> What's up? So I'm in California. Just if, if in case you're wondering, I was wondering. I was wondering about that. Uh, it says here that my internet is not, is the stream less good tonight. Let's go in the chat because it says, it says our stream quality has been degraded. I would love to. Project 2 Arrow, great to have you. A uh, little technical, very professional television segue. No, okay, I want to tell everyone the story about how we met. So, Ash 21, we are. Uh, I'm at like a, a AOPA party, and I get a phone call uh, from a friend of ours in the chat, and she's like, you got to come to the night air show. These two uh, air show pilots are going to like escort you into this area. We can watch the air show together. Super fun. And I sit down on a blanket on the grass, and next to me, drinking some wine, is you. I think. Yes, I was. I think it was. <laughs> I think it was. So I was actually laughing because I realized that the only time we've ever seen each other in person is in darkness, Ryan. That's true. Do I look at all true. like what you Well, remember? it's funny because I, I was watching some of your videos, and I'm like, oh, that's what he looks like in the daylight. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh god <laughs> that's what that guy looks like uh when the darkness isn't hiding all the flaws um and so here's the thing right no one introduced us really other than like oh this is beth and i was like oh hi i'm ryan and then afterwards we were kind of talking about your podcast we're going to talk about that later your your awesome podcast that you just started and then i started doing some re you're like legit like you're everywhere I was sitting next to a legend, and I didn't even know it. Oh, gosh. I, I get around, I guess. I'm big in <laughs> Japan. I'm big in Japan, Ryan. <laughs> so, so aerobatic pilot, that's a thing that you do. 
<laughs> you, you're, you're like waiting for you to do those. Aerobatic pilot. It's a thing. A- aviation writer is a thing. And now yeah. uh, podcasters. So we're going to talk about yeah. all three of those tonight. Um, but I always ask everyone, I have like a, I found a beer, a beer cap on the, it's like what I'm fiddling with tonight. Um, super profesh. All right. What I ask everybody when we start the show is I want to hear, I think everyone else wants to hear what your aviation origin story is. So, uh, I would love to know, like, just for all of us who, who haven't heard that story before, like, how did you get started flying planes? Well, it was super random, out of the blue, impulse hit me. I woke up one morning, literally out of nowhere, thinking it would be cool to learn how to fly. Now, this made no sense because I had never been in a small airplane. I never was interested in airplanes, aviation, nothing. Like, it literally came out of the blue. And I was thinking, actually, I was thinking, I want to be a helicopter pilot. So I Googled. So I Googled how to become a helicopter pilot. And Google said, it's really hard and really expensive. Get your fixed wing first. So I went ahead and I felt really kind of sheepish actually about it because, you know, here I am, a woman of a certain age. It's not like (laughs) I wanted to do this as a second career. It's not like I have gobs of money to throw away on a very expensive hobby. I wanted to just do it just because it was compelling for some strange reason. And so I was a little embarrassed. And I, I mentioned to a friend of mine, I said, I said, um, I'm thinking about wanting to become a pilot. Like I was kind of wor- like a little sheepish and embarrassed. And she said, Oh, well, you know, Peter's a pilot. Now Peter's her husband. I'd known them socially for several years at this point. And I never knew this guy was a pilot. And knowing what I know now about like, you know, you know that joke, how do you know when a pilot enters the room? They they tell you. Yeah, yeah, they so tell I, you. So, you know, yeah. I've, known this, I've known this guy for several years and he never told me he was a pilot. So I thought this guy's the most humble pilot ever. So anyway, I said, well, do you think he'd take me up for a flight with him? And she's like, yeah, sure. So I went up with him on, it was Friday the 13th, a very auspicious day for your very first flight in a small airplane in a Cessna 172. That sounds like disaster. That sounds like disaster <laughs> waiting to happen. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I got off that flight and signed up and started my flight training like two weeks later. So um, I live here in the Central Valley of California. And in the wintertime, we get socked in with Thule fog, this very dense sort of ground fog. And so learning to fly in December in the Central Valley is not the best time to start flying. So I just kept getting skunked like flight after flight after flight. So I said, forget this let me just do ground school i'll get my ground school out of the way take my my written and then start my actual flight training in the summertime so that's what i did i basically memorized ground school because i hadn't really ever flown so i didn't know what any of this stuff was that i was learning i just memorized it and took the test then i started learning how to fly and i did pretty well until i got to the part where uh i had to land the airplane apparently that's like an important part of getting your pilot's license. I heard and, that that was important. <laughs> and I just like sucked so hard at it and I couldn't get it. And here I was, I think I was like at 34 or 37 hours and I still wasn't ready to solo yet. And I was just like ready to quit. I'm like, I can't do this. This is like way harder than anything I've ever done in my life. You know, I'm an English major. I don't do like math and science and machines. And so that's everything that flying is. So I almost freaking quit. And I came home and I told my boyfriend, I'm like, I'm done. I I can't do this. And he said, he goes, well, he gave me a hard time. He's like, well, you're going to quit now. And I'm like, no. So anyway, I persevered. I actually, I wrote a poem called ode to 168 landings because that's what I had 168 landings for like 34 freaking hours of flight time. And, uh, it goes like this. I'll 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 tell it to you if you want, Ryan. I can Heck recite yeah, my poem. Yeah. Do, do we do? Yes. Can we? Can this be a poetry slam also? Yeah. Do you so. want me to get some bongos? Like, is it like? Um... <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. So, holes burned in the pattern while practicing landings. Learning the skill set is proving demanding. Too high, too low, too fast, too slow. Flaring late, flaring early. Base to final is squirrely. Saint Ralph in the right seat pulls tricks from his bag, 
watching me go as I zig and I zag. Here's hoping that one day I'll get it just right. Then look to the sky, see my spirit take flight. I'm so. clapping. Sorry, I, I muted because I didn't <laughs> want to interrupt. I'm clapping. That, I mean, that's going to be a good segue in a minute to to the writing aspect of your career. But that was, that's fun. I want to I want to hear that again. Well, you know, I you can listen to the recording. I'm sure. So <laughs> I'm just going to put it on repeat he, tomorrow. You know, so this this aviation has taught me so much, and I'm sure we'll talk about this over the course of our conversation here. But, you know, here was something that I thought I couldn't do, that I didn't have the talent to do, that I was incapable of doing. And I just decided to get off my back with my little perfectionist tendencies, like, oh, I'm going to solo at 20 hours and I'm going to get my pilot's license at 40 hours. You know, when I looked into it, the average hours for a pilot is 85. No one freaking tells you this when they sign no, they you up because you're, you're doing the math like $125 times, you know, 40. Right. No, um, like, oh, it's going to take you about 40 hours. Yeah. Exactly so how much you need. <laughs> so it was, it was just, um, when I finally, uh, past my check ride, which was, it was just a little bit over a year it took me because I was doing it part time. I realized that this was like the biggest accomplishment of my life. I'm like more than like college graduation, more like completing a triathlon. I mean, this was like the biggest thing I'd ever done. And I realized if I can do this, I can do anything. And that has just been such a huge um, holding that moving forward in my life has just been such a huge um, gift that I, and you know, I always say that if I never flew again after I got my check ride, it would have been worth the price of admission just, just for everything that, that has come from it. So, so here I am, I just passed my check ride. I'm in all sweaty in my little beat up 172. It's July and my DPE goes in to sign my paperwork. And I, I can so clearly remember this. I open the door and I'm kind of like stunned and like, in awe that I actually just did this. And I yeah. stepped my foot out onto the tarmac and a voice in my head, I heard it very, very clearly. I hear voices sometimes. It said, what next? Mm. And I thought, damn it, Beth, like really can't you just revel in this one accomplishment before thinking of the next thing? You know, like this is a huge thing. And what was in my mind was, I was very uncomfortable with the idea of stalls in is spins and you know as a private pilot you don't have to demonstrate spin recovery you just memorize the checklist and i thought what are the chances that i would you know in an emergency situation in a spin i would you know pull it out sure. through a memorized checklist so i actually the what next was i went in to my examiner and i said where can i get unusual attitude and spin recovery training and she told me well, there's this guy Wayne up at my airport community where I live who does spin recovery training. And so that is how three weeks after my check ride, I found myself up at Pine Mountain Lake Air Park with air show legend Wayne Handley in his extra 300. It was only three weeks later? It was three weeks later. I, I just did not feel comfortable with the, I mean, obviously I demonstrated, um, capability and skill but i just every time we pull that you know yoke back and get that stall on that buffet i was just very uncomfortable and i wanted so i i used to whitewater kayak prior to um flying and i remember that it took me like it took me hours and hours in the in the pool with an instructor learning how to roll up you know to do a combat roll in your kayak i've always wanted to separately teach me that i would love i need help I used to be a big kayaker, never could get the bravery to like, and like flip it over. So, it's well, amazing. it's just, it, it takes Super practice. Hard. It takes yeah. practice. And, and so I thought, well, the same thing again. It's like, well, if I go into a spin, I mean, if somebody told me, like, as I was kayaking, so, you know, lean forward, sweep around, snap your hips, I'm like, what are the chances you would actually kinesthetically do that? So, anyway, so. What does even I, that... snapping your hips mean? I don't know. <laughs> So yes, I, I was up. I you know I made, when I decide to do something, I just kind of go for it. So that's why that's why I ended up flying um, with Wayne, and I didn't know who this guy was actually. I I had I I I'd never been to an air show. I had never even heard of such a thing as competition aerobatics. I knew zero. I, I knew that people did like loop de loops and barnstorming, but like I really didn't know anything about this world. And so I went up there, and I'm like, oh my god, like this is like 
the most amazing fun thing I've ever done. So like I was originally like fear was my motivation for starting to do this, but it actually was just the most fun I had in my life. So I totally did not see this coming, but I just like jumped in obsessed with aerobatics for like the next eight years. So that that's really interesting. So this is one of those. I mean, the joke with the audience of this show is that whoever is on my show, that is the thing that's either the plane I want to buy or the type of flying I want to do for the next week until the next show. Like I just I fall in love every week with a new part of aviation through meeting all the people on the show. But I I have a I wanted to ask about this because I have a little bit of aerobatic time. And it was air, it was like basic fighter maneuvers, like air combat stuff. Mm -hmm. And I ralphed so, I just puked so much. And there's part of me that, there's, I mean, it was like high, it was like, it was high intent. There was no like middle ground. It was like pull the stick, you know, get upside down, chase him to the ocean. It was actually, uh, we flew out of Fullerton, not too probably far from where you're at, I think, maybe, I don't know. I think that's in um, Southern California, yeah. Yeah, somewhere. So uh, California, you know, it's everything's really close in California. <laughs> it's such a small state. Um, and, and I got sick a lot. Like, I just got so sick. And what, I, what I've been wanting to ask is, uh, for me, aerobatics is a thing I keep wanting to come back to. One, for the, like, proficiency side, what you're talking about in terms of, like, unusual attitudes and stuff. I think there's part of it for me that feels like that would be a, a safety thing. But there's also this part of me that's, like, that same, like, what's next? And it's, like, well, I should go do my instrument. Or I should go do something, right, to, like, become better. What, like, what advice do you have? And I'm actually going to, you sent me a video of you. Here, let's pull this video up. You sent me a video of you, like, cranking it out. Uh, but like I, is that, is that what you said? <laughs> cranking it out. Um, I was cranking it out. I admit. But like, what is what is the like? What advice would you have to someone who wants to get started in this? As someone who like three weeks, you're like, boom, I gotta, I gotta keep going with this, and then I'll, I'll play this video. Like this is you. Like, people are gonna see in this video in a second. Like you're like doing stuff. So. I don't know. Sorry, that's a long-winded way to ask the question. How how do I get like how do you actually get started? Like you've got like a, a card and I see like sp- probably a sportsman sequence card or something. I don't know. I'm yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah. So well, to answer your question, uh, and right now in the video, I'm walking the sequence. This was uh, I think this was the intermediate sequence a um, few years back. I was practicing. So if you want to get started in aerobatics, you go to a aerobatic instructor or flight school and sign up for a lesson and sometimes people do get sick like you had that experience luckily i never got air sick i was kind of like bulletproof thank god i don't know why it just was some freak of my physiology but even if people who do get air sick if you keep at it you get over it you definitely um can get past your air sickness i had a, a teammate who who could do like 10 minutes flights and she would puke. And then finally, eventually she got, she got dialed in. So you can totally do that. I think with the air combat stuff, they might've just been a little rough on you. So, you know, again, it's like working out. You don't like go and run a marathon the very first time you get off the couch, you kind of build yourself up to it. You know, like this kind of stuff, this, um, the G tolerance, you know, pull in plus five, you know, minus two ish G's. That's not too much. Um, but if you're not used to it, it, it's, it's a lot. So. Yeah. And I think we did like, we did like four G's in that air combat stuff. And it was like the, both the best and worst day of my life. You know, you're like, that was the coolest thing I've ever done, but also maybe the most horrible I've ever felt. Uh, Yeah. You know what? Four G's is no joke. And so if you've never done aerobatics and you're doing four G's, that's that's, again, pretty, pretty rough. You know, I think, you know, I've flown when you fly with aerobatic passengers, you want to and, you know, maybe it's different with air combat, but you want to give people a good experience. You don't want to make people sick. You don't want them to feel bad. So, you know, when I've taken people up, I've been very gentle. I've been very reticent of like, how do you feel? You know, like, is your mouth starting to go dry? You know, are you starting (laughs) to feel queasy? Because, you know, once it gets there, it doesn't go back. It's like as soon as that starts happening, you have to go back to the airport so it sounds like you kind of had a little bit of rough ride there 
Well, and I think separately they're part of it is like, you know, they want to give you like the experience of training to be a fighter pilot, right? Oh, that video stopped. Uh so they're a little bit of like, oh, like you know, this is what it's like. Go kill him. Right? <laughs> you know, and I think it's they they were I will say, uh Spartan, the guy sitting next to me was very caring when he looked over me and saw the tears dripping down my face <laughs> as I was like holding the puke down. He was like, "You okay?" It was like my dad, like, "You all right?" with a little a little hint of like, "Don't you don't you do it." I, yeah, I puke it. in a plane is not good. Well, I will tell you, I cannot say any names because it is embargoed information, but the <laughs> the <laughs> the the actors in Top Gun 2 that was mm -hmm. obviously filmed down in Southern California. Uh, they flew with an aerobatic pilot for multiple training sorties so that they could build up their tolerance was that, for Gs. Was that aerobatic so, pilot you? No, no, no. Well, no, no, it was not me. No, <laughs> no. It, they, they flew with somebody to, to build up their tolerance. So I guess my point is, is nobody just wakes up and is a fighter pilot. You have to build up to that. It's so. true. True. Uh, I want to just go to the chat real quick. Some people have, have responded. One, guys, yeah, no glasses. Sorry. I wore contacts because I'm an adult and I can do that. Uh, I'm trying to be a better, more attractive me. Uh, let's see. Uh, people are saying now that you are, maybe you already have, but people are saying if you haven't done your helicopter, now you should do that. If you haven't done your helicopter stuff. Well, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you the story on that. So... Yeah, so I've been, I did hardcore competition aerobatics for pretty much eight mm -hmm. years straight. Like did like five contests a season, was all in, was partners in the laser with that airplane, the blue plane that I was flying. Um, it was, it was hardcore. And after a while I started to get a little, can I tell you a secret? I, I you started, definitely can tell me a secret. I, I started to get a little bit bored. What? Yeah, I, know. I get it though. I, I'm like broke. I'm like broken. I don't know like what's wrong with me. But I, I started to just, you know, I, I was moving up categories. You know, I went from primary sportsman intermediate and I was practicing advanced categories. So, you know, moving up a category is a way to make things more interesting for sure. But I realized that aerobatics, you know, even when you move up cat categories, you're still drawing lines in the sky. You're just drawing more doohickeys. Um, in the lines and they get more complex. And I was just kind of feeling a little restless. And I actually wrote, uh, for five years, I wrote a, a column for Sport Aerobatics Magazine and it was called Brilliance and Buffoonery because in aerobatics, sometimes you can just be so brilliant and the next second it's like abject buffoonery and you have to kind of allow like your ego to accept that that's the case. And um, so I wrote this column for five years and my last column that I wrote a couple years ago was actually titled The Seven Year Itch. And I'm just like wondering if like um, I was just kind of ready to move on. I think I just crave... Sure just crave different experiences. And it's not to say that I don't still love it and that I wouldn't go back to it, but I just kind of needed a bit of a change. So, so anyway, rotorcraft rating, I thought, okay, let me go back and look into getting my, my rotorcraft rating. And I did do a couple of lessons in an R22. And it actually turns out that flying uh, an uh, inherently unstable aircraft with very light control surfaces that require mm -hmm. a lot of rudder really sets you up for success for flying helicopters because oh, it's all of those things so i was actually yeah. not to to sound immodest but i was i was kind of sort of hovering like in my second hour now granted there was plenty of buffoonery there but i was just like huh this could be kind of cool but dude it is stupid stupid expensive like like yeah. i bought aerobatics was expensive no no so i actually applied for a scholarship for my rotorcraft add-on rating through the whirly girls that's the female that's a cool name that's a cool name. helicopter pilot association the whirly girls and i thought well if they pay ten thousand dollars towards my rotorcraft add-on that might be doable I, I did not get the the scholarship however you know it is what it is but um so i kind of put the rotorcraft rating on on hold for now just because i don't want to be a commercial rotorcraft pilot and again like what sure. do you do with a private helicopter rating like someone going to go rent you a helicopter but that being said 
I just want to do it. And so I'm just thinking, you know, even if I just go and fly around to just kind of put myself in the environment and, and do it, I, I still am going to do that. It's, it's, I, I, it's, it's funny. Everyone talks about that. Well, there's two things that are, that you were talking earlier about like the soloing and things like that. And I think it's so important to, to, we have a lot of aspiring pilots, uh, watching the show. They chime in a lot. I think the big thing that your lesson from like your, your, your single engine land part of your career, right. Is like, it's not a race. Like it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like it's not a race to like how quick you solo or it's not a race to how quick you hover. Right. It's just like everyone's dealing with some different crap and they, mm -hmm. and they learn differently. And the fact that you're showing up every day, we talked about this with Bruno on the show last week too. everyone. It was like this idea of like, you know, the fact that you're here putting in the time alone makes you exceptional uh, because most people don't even do this. So that that's one thing I wanted to call back. But then two, everyone I know is that wants to do helicopters. It's just like, it's like, you gotta be a doctor or something. It's like, there's like, no, it's just so expensive. So, well, it's, it's funny that when I told my aerobatic friends that I wanted to go off and get my helicopter rating, they were horrified. They're wait, like, what? what? They're so dangerous. Oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> they're just like, and they're so ugly. And bleh, why would you? So it's really funny. Um, yeah, it's uh, there's, you know, I think different categories of aircraft have different uh, people have different opinions about them. But I don't know. I think I think all the flying stuff is cool. Everything that flies is cool. I want to we I was getting the pictures ready uh, while you were talking about it a little bit. But I wanted to show like your you talked a little bit about your like career in aerobatic flight. Like you've flown a lot of like they're like. Yeah. So that was actually stuff. that was actually my first contest. So. Um, so basically just real quick. So I went and flew with Wayne Handley that first time up in August, 10 years ago now. Yeah. And, and then I went back in September and then I went back in October and then I went back in November and he said, you need to stop spending all your money with me and go do something responsible, like go get your instrument rating. So that's when I turned around and joined the international aerobatic club. Cause I thought, Hey, if I want to do aerobatics, let me hang around with the people who are doing aerobatics. So IEC, it's a division of the EAA. I looked at my local chapter here in Northern California, went to a meeting. Um, and there I met, uh, one of the, one of the guys from chapter 38, his name's Dave Watson. And he was the vice president at the time. And, uh, he offer he coaches a lot of the of the members of that chapter and he said okay uh, so i started doing i started flying with him in a super decathlon so i did a couple lessons in the super d and then it was like june mid-june and he says to me hey um i have the opportunity to go and be a contest director at a contest in sterling colorado would you want to come and fly primary category in the pits because his mentor dagmar kress it was her contest. Mm. And I said, well, first of all, uh, I don't know how to fly a pits and that's in six weeks. And so I thought, well, of course, yes. So that's why six weeks later, I was up in Sterling, Colorado, flying my very first contest. And this is Dagmar Kress's gorgeous brand new pits as to see that she so graciously allowed Dave oh, to fly. Pits different pits but they she allowed um dave to fly a safety pilot with me in in her brand new pits so that was that was an amazing experience so so i flew super decathlon and then i flew the pits and then um flew the the laser which was that single seat aircraft i was showing you yeah, earlier i i think I, we've got well this it's that's the that's wayne hanley's extra 300 so that's the very first yeah. aerobatic airplane i ever flew so so you yeah, started in an extra which is like hardcore <laughs> separately well so so it's really funny though it's funny you say that ryan because okay the first the first plane i flew was an extra then the second one i started flying was like the pits and then my coach dave was like you really need to get in the decathlon and really learn the skills because you know an, an extra will have it has like a 360 degree roll rate per second the decathlon has like a uh 90 degree per second roll rate so it's like you re really have to work the decathlon so he goes i'm like okay so i flew i had flown a few contests in the pits and then he's like you really need to get in the super d and just like nail down your skills so when people would tell me what, what i was flying and i would say well oh i'm transitioning from an extra to a pits to a decathlon 
and then everyone would of yeah. course start laughing because it usually goes the opposite way but um so that this picture right here was the first day that i ever flew uh the laser which by the way you guys Flying a single seat aircraft really is a rite of passage because now, okay, we painted it. We, we did a complete overhaul. Sorry, I'm just so clicking <laughs> through. You can tell me to stop. <laughs> no, it's, no, no, no. You can keep it there. It's the same plane. I just didn't want people to be confused. We, we did a major makeover on her. Um, but the other picture with me, that was right after I landed after my very first flight. The, the thing is in a single seat aircraft, nobody can show you how to fly it. You have to get in and just fly it. Now, granted, you can fly aircraft that you think, you know, are kind of maybe similar handling characteristics. But in reality, you just have to like, you have to just stack up and, and do it. And I remember I was getting ready. This is up at Livermore. And I'd, I, it was like my third trip from the bathroom because I kept having to pee. And I kept in my head thinking, well, you know, maybe next week, you know, I, I don't have to do it today. And, you know, I kept like psyching sure. myself up and I'm thinking, Beth, you're not going to be any more skilled next weekend than you are right now. And it's really funny, Ryan. It's so weird. As I was walking back from the bathroom that third time, my phone rings in my pocket and I pick it up and it's Wayne Handley. And he's like, hey, what's, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm at Livermore and I'm getting ready to solo the laser for the first time. And he said, and I said, I'm really nervous. And he said, good, you should be nervous. <laughs> and he told me, he told me about plenty of times where he flew aircraft for the very first time. And he says, you know, just get in there and do it. And, you know, you got the skills. And he said, call me when you get back. He goes, I know you're going to be fine. I want to hear your voice. And so what I did is I, I, I phoned the tower at Livermore and I'm like, dudes, I need to be flying the laser for the first time, you know, clear the decks, don't, you know, give me the big runway. <laughs> my, my, my coach was on, on frequency on with the radio. And so, you know, I just took off and went out and flew around to the practice area and just, you know, did some slow flight and didn't do any, all I did is a loop and a roll. I hardly, I was just, I, all I could think about was getting back and landing that thing. Like I was like, that's the thing. So, I came back and they had switched the runways because the, the winds had shifted, which is fine. And uh, I remember my coach was saying, if it's, if you're not a hundred percent sure, go around. And I'm like, okay. So basically no, there's no flaps on this aircraft. So the, basically the landing is hundred miles an hour spinner on the numbers, like, cause you can't go slower cause you sink. So I was like hundred mile an hour spinner on the numbers. And I was like, 98% sure. I wasn't a hundred percent sure. So I went around and then I came back and he says, pull the throttle a little bit slower. And then I came in and dude, I did like the, I have never done such a good landing and I have yet to do such a, a good one. This so good since I went, I landed it so soft. It was like, I didn't even know I was on the ground yet. So I think I was just like, so laser focused, ha, no pun intended. Ha. And so, so then, um, you know, I, I taxied over and, you know, went, got to the hangar and I, you know, turned off, you know, turned off the mags and I reached over to, um, unlatch the canopy and my hand was shaking as I went to unlatch the canopy, but it was so funny. I, I wasn't nervous as soon as like the engine turned over when I, when I started, I was just complete focus, focus. And I didn't think about nerves. I didn't think about anything. And it wasn't until after I landed and got back to the hangar and I went to unlatch the canopy where I was like, whoo. So, um, that was, this aircraft is just so much it's really the most fun airplane i've ever flown because it's kind of like you're wearing it it's a small airplane so it's less power than the extra but it has less um weight to it so i don't know it's just like you're, you're wearing it and you just it's like an extension of your body you just kind of fling it around it's it's a joy to fly so i guess i have to search barnstormers for those <laughs> they're they're um ho they're home built so they're they're few and far between Ooh. they're very pretty rare know, a spider just came, came <laughs> down in front of my face i'm in my basement i mean you guys can see that this wow. is like interrupting us uh is it's a, a little sign? guy it's a little is that guy a sign what does that mean i don't know but i really actually am quite terrified of spiders but i kept it together i i'm proud on, of you ryan I'm we're on the internet you. um <laughs> I want to, with that inter, in, interruption, we should say some, some people have been saying hi to you in the chat. Uh, Steph Strickland, of course, cheering you on. Uh, this guy, Todd, was like, oh, my sister's a total badass. I don't know. That, that I, I believe that is my brother. <laughs> yep, Todd's here. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, uh, Becky Wilbur is yeah, agreeing with Becky. him. 
uh who else is in here uh bed ben singer is here sarah nissler's here which hey, is amazing sarah. she sarah. was there on the blanket that sounds bad I know. She, but she was there we were hanging we were out. all three of us on the blanket <laughs> all right uh <laughs> moving so, on <laughs> moving on eric o'connor is here oh home Oh, that's home. Oh. He was also on the blanket. He was on the blanket. He's my he's my French fighter pilot friend. Home. <laughs> yeah. I like I we got to get him on the show. I didn't know wait, his did. actual name. You know, I, just, I I when you said Eric at first I'm like who is that Eric and I'm like wait a second that's home. Yeah. Well, yeah. hey, you should be on the show, buddy. It's good to see you. <laughs> uh so <laughs> it's like all the people from that night. Kyle Ludwig, Kyle Ludwig is here too. Oh, hi, Kyle. Or he was, or he, ha- he went, came and left. I just have one thing to say. Smart Glide. Oh. <laughs> that was for That's Kyle. an inside joke for everybody uh, from the blanket. Anyway, it's a all right. Garmin product. <laughs> guys, uh, like Squirrel, like guys, I... So what, the show, you shouldn't be surprised that I get distracted on the show by now. It's 60 million episodes. Um, anyway, uh, so you did so you did all this aerobatic stuff. You're separately an English major when you were in school. Tell me a little bit of how you transitioned to write. Because, like, you sent me, so like, I think actually some of my more favorite articles you've written. Um, oh, thank you. I might just be saying that, but like, uh, oh, that's probably from your training, upside down. Yes, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jason says, "How big of a blanket was it?" Not that. <laughs> we not were that very. Big. We were very close. We were, we were very close. Uh, this like this like this is you yeah. like with with a so, that magazine they printed a big one. So I'll tell you I'll tell you the the story. I'll give you the abridged version, obviously. But so I told you I was writing that bi-monthly column for sport aerobatics magazine and you know we can't get into this whole thing on of all the different threads of these stories ryan because you know we only have an hour but i was crewing at the reno air races one year and i was crewing for my friend jeff rose who was a rookie in the biplane class and he had his um red pits and so since i was flying a pits i had a t-shirt made up that said nice pits and it had um, two pits biplanes um, on display in the front of the um, shirt upside down. And so the the, the legend is I had, <laughs> I purposely did not put a picture of this for you to show because I wasn't didn't want to go into this whole story. But it is pertinent to this topic of conversation because I wrote an article for Sport Aerobatics magazine that was it was called Hey Bob Nice Pits and it was telling the story of how I had Bob Hoover sign the bosom of my oh, nice wait, pits. I've t-shirt. seen this picture. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I've seen a picture of this happening. I think it's on your Instagram. Yeah, so it's somewhere. So so anyway, because this was Bob Hoover obviously was still around at this point. I think he was like 91 at this time. And so like that was like my one of my crowning moments of my life is I had like Bob Hoover sign this my shirt, my nice pits shirt. He was very tickled, by the way. And so when I wrote this article for the magazine, <clears throat> the same. Um, so sporty sport aerobatics is part of EAA. So, you know, EAA has sport aviation magazine, sport aerobatics. Um, experimenter, you know, they have Warbirds mm-hmm. vintage. So the, the same woman, um, Livy, who does the layout art for sport aerobatics, does the layout for some of the other magazines. And she kept telling Jim Busha, who's the director of publications sure. at the time, he's now vice president. Um, she goes, you have to read this girl, you, you got to read her stuff. So Jim read my nice pit story. And he called me up and he asked if I would write for if I wanted to write for sport aviation magazine. And I was like, oh, yes, please. Yeah, so maybe next so, week. I know. I was like so excited. So then uh, apropos, you know, we, we had a little conversation about, oh, well, what am I going to write about? Blah, blah, blah. He's like, well, you're a female. You're an erratic pilot. You have a fresh you know, point of view, blah, blah, blah. And so then apropos of nothing is we're getting off the phone. He happens to say, do you know Luca Bertosio? And it was so right. weird because I literally had just met Luca like two months earlier because I was up training up in Williams Soaring Center in Williams, California with flying in aerobatic gliders. I didn't know you guys, that's a thing. You can fly gliders, there's aerobatic gliders. And Luca is an Italian 
champion aerobatic glider pilot. And when in the wintertime, he, he lives in Italy, but he trains at, at Williams. So I actually friggin met Luca two months earlier, randomly enough. So when Jim's like, do you know Luca? I'm like, uh, yeah, I do actually. And Luca was making his um, US air show debut at Oshkosh that year it was 2015. And they yeah. wanted him on the cover of the magazine, you know, this young, hot shot, Red Bull sponsored, you know, glider pilot. And Jim's like, would you write the cover story? <laughs> would you want to write the story? And I'm like, Yes. So the very first article I ever wrote for Sport Aviation actually was the cover story. And this was the Oshkosh issue for um, 2015. So then as we're having this conversation, Jim's like, well, hey, were you planning on coming to Oshkosh this year? And I'm like, no, I'd been Oshkosh once in 2012, right after I'd become a private pilot. And he's like, well, you know, if you come out, you know, we'll give you a press pass, a golf cart, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, golf cart. wow, may, like, maybe I will. Maybe I will come. So it's worth, um, the, it's worth it for the golf cart alone. That's like <laughs> that's so, a prized possession at Oshkosh. It, it, it is. So I so now I think this was my sixth year is a member of EAA mm -hmm. Media. And um, I write feature articles for all of their magazines and uh, actually, I've been writing now an aerospace innovation column for Sport Aviation Magazine. Now, I think this is my sixth year going on with that. And that's, I love writing that. So being in this gig has offered me a lot of really amazing opportunities. Um, one of them is I, I was actually a test pilot for a eVTOL flying car prototype. I've oh, actually, cool. I've actually, um, flown uh i met trace clements he's the caretaker for burt rutan's boomerang and uh, mm. i flew in the boomerang with trace a couple years ago right before COVID happened and so just just kind of have met so many amazing people and has had really some amazing experiences as a result of having this writing gig it's so it yeah i mean uh the I, this show is same thing Right? Like I keep having all mm -hmm. these magical, I mean, like meeting you, mm -hmm. right? Like just meet, like just people, experiences, whatever. Uh, speaking of one of those people that I've met, uh, one of them, I feel like I have to do whatever she says. Steph Strickland says, uh, ask Beth what her golf cart number was this year, please. <laughs> and thank you. So there you go, Steph. <laughs> he said this is a family show, Steph. <laughs> Yeah. I I've did been say briefed. kids watch the show. I've be, I've been briefed not to use too many four letter words here. So, but this isn't a four letter word. It's basically two numbers, Ryan. So, my golf cart at Oshkosh this year was number sixty nine. I don't see anything inappropriate or unusual or. Uh, I just thought no... you know. No, nothing about that that is nothing yeah. at all no no and i i had my stickers for my podcast and i put the stickers on my golf cart and i was like hoping they'd come off at the end of the week which, which thank god they did um so yeah i i noticed was some people like looking and pointing and laughing at my golf cart number which they probably wouldn't have noticed it if i didn't have it like emblazoned on either side with my podcast stickers but the yeah. the, the 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 lord works in mysterious ways ryan the that does. Steph's like, thanks, man. <laughs> and says that you were so happy about that. Um, I was very happy. So, I mean, let's talk about this a little bit. Like, you sent over just a couple... Uh, here we go. Um, like, you've got... Thi like, this is a thing. Yeah, that did. was... Uh that was a story that I, I wrote about the Petey brothers. Now, when when Mark when Mike Petey when Draco came on the scene, you know, a few years ago, every loving aviation magazine in the universe wrote an article on on um, Draco, which is was an extraordinary aircraft. However, I didn't know this, but. I didn't know that. Like, I had met Mike at the Mojave Experimental Fly-in in. April of 2018, he flew Turbulence, which was his crazy Lance Air Franken plane that sure. was like monster. France. Oh, so, so here I am, met Mike. He actually won best build at the Mojave Experimental Fly in that year. So then a month later, I'm up at a fly in in Mac Mesa, Colorado. And we're all, it's like this fat tire, it's called the Fat Tire Jamboree. And it was like all bush planes at this you high. Go everywhere. 
Well, you're like, you're like I just ran into Luca. I just ran into Luca. Well, so so here's the thing. So here I am. It's nighttime. Everyone's standing around the campfire drinking beers, and I'm just sort of like have my little antennas out, and I I hear these guys around the campfire, and I heard one of them say Reno and talking about Reno, and of course I'm like, ooh, my little antenna went up, and so I kind of go over and I'm like eavesdropping in and listening to them talking about Reno, and they're talking about Reno air races, and this one guy looks really familiar. And I, I just, there was a lull in the conversation and I said, you look really familiar to me. I know you from somewhere. And he said, I have a twin brother. And I just laughed because I thought he was pulling my leg, but it actually was Mark Patey. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't realize that Mike and Mark were brothers and were twins. And it was just, I ran into Mark. So when I realized, when I started learning the story about how those two brothers, how, what extraordinary things that they do and how just literally ADD insane geniuses that they are and what they've done. That article that was on the cover of Sport Aviation, the, the angle that I took for that story was actually the Petey brothers. And I think I called the story twin engines. Um, the Petey brothers are flying forces of nature. And it really kind of goes through like their life and how they got to be where they are now. And um, a lot of people really appreciated sort of that human interest side of that sure. story. So that was really cool. It's funny you mentioned turbulence. Uh I don't know what he was doing in at Timmerman Airport, but one day I was just uh, just uh, actually it was the one of the first Super Arrow episodes uh, was filmed with some friends of mine in, in my one seventy two, and as we walked past the ramp, there was turbulence just sitting there, and I was like, "I'm sorry, ladies, I need to go Google <laughs> this airplane for a minute," and they're like, "Well, it is very orange." It and I was like, "Yeah, orange. I need to get a closer look." And then, like the the ramp, even like the ramp guys were like, "Yeah, man, I don't know why it's here, but don't touch it." <laughs> well, so I, I I will tell you, there's a very so, so the the reason why I was up at Mac Mesa, Colorado, for this fat tire jamboree, is because of an article that I wrote. And so I just got done telling you how writing these stories leads to some like amazing experiences. So. It was Air Venture 2017, and I'm zipping around on my golf cart, not n number 69 that year, but I was zipping somewhere and I had to get back to the photo building or something. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a group of young people all wearing these very neat red polo shirts with logos standing around this beautifully painted uh, Cherokee. And I literally zipped by them because I was on a mission to get to where I needed to go. Now I have like, when I go to Air Venture, Ryan, it's very weird. I call it like the magic of Oshkosh, like weird things happen. Well, you alluded to it already of our meeting on the blanket. Just you, you, you yeah. end up in a place and, and something catch. So I really, it's, it's funny not to sound like all like woo woo, but I really like move by instinct when I'm at Oshkosh. Like, do I go left? Do I go right? I go where like, where it feels like I should go. Um, so I, I zip by these, these kids and I kept going like for another, like five or 10 seconds. And I'm like, turn around and go back, Beth, turn around and go back. So I turn around and went back and I'm like, what's up with you guys? Like, what, who are you and what are you doing? Well, no, <laughs> get I didn't my, see it like Get that. off my lawn. <laughs> No, I was just curious because, you know, you don't see a lot of yeah. young kids. And, and so the short story is, is they are part of an organization that is based at Mac Mesa, Colorado, called Hawk Aviators. And Hawk stands for High Country Aviation Workshop for Kids. And it's a nonprofit organization where there's this group of mentors and builders and instructors and the kids go in and they wrench on airplanes so they learn how to build and they learn how to fabricate and for every hour or i think it's every three hours that they work they earn one hour of flight time hey, that's not so a bad it's just deal. this it's this amazing program and i'm like i'm getting just chills just telling you about it and so i'm like this is a story you know because everybody's like how do we get young people in aviation and yeah. young eagles flights are wonderful but here's like people really doing something to get kids so i wrote this story i interviewed everyone over the phone months later but i just thought i would love to go see this because it sounded like some fairyland like grass strip on a plateau on a mesa with just like all these cool bush planes and so when they had that fat tire jamboree i'm like i'm going i'm going yeah i'm just gonna so i got on a plane and i went and um 
Lad Klingelsmith, who's the airport manager and, and good friend, actually of Wayne Handley's, he came down and picked me up at Grand Junction in his carbon cub, which is actually the the very first carbon cub that was ever off the line. So he came and picked me up. So I felt like royalty. They brought me up to the airport. And I swear, you know, again, I mean, I'm so happy to to bring people's stories out into the world. Like that's the joy out of doing this work. But they were treating me like they were like, oh, you know, because that story had gotten them so much um, publicity and they had people donating money and donating airplanes and donating time. And like, how can we help? Oh, wow. How can you how can you help us start a, a program like this? So they were they were really like rolling out the red carpet for me. And so Eddie Clements, who was the general manager of Hawk, unfortunately, so, so sadly, he passed away um, a couple years later. He he was just like he pulled all those stops out. So I'm going to tell you on May 18th. 2018, I, I posture that I am the only person on planet Earth that did this particular aviation thing. I'm very curious about this. You, you, you kind of teased this to me in an email and you said, yes. well, I mean, I could be wrong, but, and then we could maybe look into it. But so that day, what I did is Eddie is a balloon instructor. So he okay. took me up at dawn and took me up for my very first balloon lesson. So I had okay. a balloon flight yeah. at dawn over the desert. Beautiful. Amazing. Later in the afternoon, I had actually my first ride ever in a Stearman. So because uh, okay. he's just he's just like pulling out the stops, take her for a ride, you know. So uh, got a ride in a Stearman, and then later in the afternoon, one of the benefactors of the Hawk program is a French gentleman who has a twin turbine A Star helicopter. Okay. And he came in and landed and Eddie said to him, you're taking her for a flight. And so I flew up and down the Colorado River Canyon in that freaking A-star for like 45 minutes. Now, I'd only been in an R-22. And let me tell you, this is not the R-22. Yeah. And I, I, I'm ruined, ruined for life. And I so were, that's actually we're out, why you're like, if it's not an A star, I'm not training it. Well, and so we were out for like 45 minutes and I think, oh my God, this must be costing like $5,000. But he, he seemed to be okay with it. So anyway, when I landed later that afternoon, I realized that I flew in less than 24 hours. It was more like a 12 hour period, three category of aircraft. I flew a balloon, I flew fixed wing, and I flew a helicopter all within like a 12 hour span. It's I don't like think that happens. I don't think that happens too much. I don't know. No, I'm just, I'm just thinking. So, and here I was proud. One day I had flown a J3, been on an Amtrak train, driven my car. Uh, planes, I've trains, all, and automobiles. That's yeah. good. <laughs> I just hadn't. I just missed like the boat to round it out. But yeah, planes, trains, and automobiles. Uh, you gotta, I gotta alert you to something that, that that's super cool. I would alert you to something that happened in the chat uh, while you were talking. Kyle Ludwig came back and said, "Someone say Smart Glide." So he, it's like you, Smart ride, Kyle. you, you like, it's like the bat signal went off and like <laughs> his Garmin watch was like, boop, 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 tune back in. They're talking about smart glide. <laughs> so was, Kyle's back. Uh, Hi, Kyle. <laughs> hey, Kyle. <laughs> I've never actually met Kyle in person. We only have a very, very smack talk type messaging situation going on between us at the moment i'm sure at some point we will meet in person yeah or, i mean hopefully. He, he, he's been on the show before and in, in his <laughs> former in his former aviation life uh at ea he was on the show uh we he did a little video with me at um at air venture this year about smart glide a little like we were trying like youtube shorts out and it was kind of fun uh so yeah that smart glide thing beep boop beep beep glide pretty cool you Very can use cool. that, Kyle. You can use that. You can put me in an ad. It's going beep, boop, beep, beep, glide. You can have that. Uh, anyway, maybe he left and now he's going to come back again. I don't know what's happening down there. Uh, talk to me. <laughs> Sorry. Talk to, so we've got, we're almost out of time. And I wanted, we could, you and I could talk all night, clearly. Um, but I wanted to talk about, I'm just going to click through some of your other stories that you, you've sent some pictures over, um, that thing, that loud thing. Yeah, that thing. was, it was fun. So the, the screaming Sasquatch, Del Collar and Jeff Bourbon's monstrosity of a jet biplane. Something else. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, then separately, like, it uh, looks like... So one of the cool world. things is, is I get a chance... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, I No, you're good. Uh, one of the cool things, like I said, I get to try all these cool experience, experiences. I was actually on the air-to-air -air photo shoot with this plane oh, over Oshkosh. So that's, cool. that's, that's, that's me in the in the passenger seat there. So, yeah, that was kind of fun. That's the first time I'd ever seen Oshkosh from the air was on that photo shoot. Oh, that's a special thing to see from... That's why everyone buys those helicopter rides. Um... And then I don't know what I did probably these pictures out of order, but I'm guessing that's you at Oshkosh. That's that's actually the very first year I went to Oshkosh in 2012, and I just had no plan. I like literally got on a plane with a backpack and a bivy and a sleeping bag, and I had no plans. And I'm like, I'm just gonna go, and uh, I ended up camping under the uh, wing of a Cessna, which is as one should when they go to Oshkosh. So that was my first year at Oshkosh. Yeah, well, I love how you color coordinated the aircraft to the tent. <laughs> That was not planned. Um, but here's the, we haven't even started to talk about. Oh, there's an air cam, and that's Sorry. I was on that for air to air photo shoot too. And by the way, like he's like bring a hat and a fleece because it's cold. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's Oshkosh. And then it's like, well, when there's 80 mile an hour wind blowing on you, it's cold. <laughs> So that, that was actually my very first water landing. That's an amphibious air cam. And as part of the photo shoot, we did um, a, a water landing, like a, a splash and dash. So that was my first um, time in a seaplane on water. So that was kind of cool. You have just like the cool, like just like oh, cool stuff. I, cool I, feel stuff. Very, I feel very lucky. Uh, so so I'm starting about... <laughs> this podcast yeah, thing. Yeah, let's talk about this podcast. <laughs> so there's that. There's this. Yes. Yeah. So I'll just, again, really quick. So I've been writing this innovation column now for six years, and I'm so fascinated by the aerospace innovation, what's going on in the world. And I thought to myself, you know, EAA is a membership association. Um, the Sport Aviation Magazine is a, a, an association magazine. You can't go buy it in a bookstore. And I thought, okay, so 240,000 people have access to the column that I write each month. So I write one column, you know, 12 times a year. I thought, what if I have a podcast? I could start like an aviation innovation podcast. And all of these people that I have interviewed over the last six years, I got like 72 of them and they're going to come on and be guests on my show and they don't know it yet. And then I thought what would be really cool is to have like a female aviation leg of the podcast and because it's like cool it cool innovation cool female pilots and so i was trying to make it like be a leg of the um, innovation podcast but i did uh, some sort of market research with people and i realized that they are actually very two separate audiences like i had sure. to have two separate podcasts and so then i thought oh no i have to have two podcasts because of course i'm an overachiever and i don't even know how to do one podcast so then a friend of mine advised let's start with one and pick the one that has more juice in it and i thought well you know what i'm a female pilot i know lots of female pilot friends who do amazing things i'm gonna go with that one so i and the 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 name i i can't even remember exactly when i came up with it but it's so funny because every time i would tell people the name of the podcast, a hundred percent of the people, men and women, as soon as I say the name of the podcast, they literally just like break out into this big smile and start laughing. <laughs> so um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it's been a huge, steep learning curve. I just dropped the second episode today. So it is uh, bi-monthly. So every other week, uh, first episode was the 18th and second episode was today. And I have this amazing lineup of, of women that do all different kinds of things in aviation. And I realized that it's, it's not just a podcast for, for pilots or women pilots. You know, there's so many cool things. I was telling a friend of mine, like what I write about in my column and like some of the things that my, my colleagues do. And they're just like, that's cool. Like, that's a thing. Like you can get in a plane and go to a grass strip and camp. Like, that's a thing. Like you could live at an airport. Like I didn't know that. So a lot of people who are not pilots who've listened to the podcast are finding it really interesting. Um, so it's like, I say like, I'm not going to climb Mount Everest, but I'll watch a show on people climbing Mount Everest. Cause that's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, and sorry, the Mount Everest thing made me think about these crate my wife watches these like crazy like survival shows and it just seems like she actually likes to watch people suffer and that makes me uncomfortable <laughs> it's like what is bottled up inside 
uh you better take her out for a nice dinner for her for your next anniversary or something especially if she sees the me saying that um actually our anniversary was last week too it was great it was two weeks ago now whatever it was uh, we it was good we're still married congratulations good Good for you yeah (laughs) we're doing it we're surviving a pandemic with children uh so I mean I get you second episode today. I think I in the in the description down below I have, I'll fix it after the show. I think I said it's like it's the first one today, but I think it's it's the second one. Uh who's on the show? Like if people want to go tune in right now, who should like what's the episode that just went live today? Yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about where you could find it. So my website is bethestanton.com. So there's a you can check that check that out and there's a podcast page on there. You can click on that link on Instagram, Badass Pilot Babes. There's links in my uh, bio. So currently right now, and this is one of the things I'm navigating is um, my podcast hosting platform is called Spreaker. So if you go to Spreaker, my podcast lives there, but it's also distributed to different um, Add a podcast on Google, and it's on about six other ones. I'm it's still pending on Apple, iTunes, um, Amazon Audible, and so it's just weird, like how you distribute the RSS feed is like I'm navigating that. So it's not on all podcast apps yet, but if you Google "badass pilot babes podcast," you will be able to find it. And I've had two amazing ladies on the show. I think you should go check them out. I won't tell you too much more, but um, I'm just, I have a whiteboard here in my office with like a list of like at least a year's worth of badass pilot babes to interview. And people are sending me more information and more people. So if anybody out there has a badass pilot babe that you think should be on the show, I would love to hear from you. Shoot me a, shoot me a message on instagram or facebook and uh yeah we'll, i'll be looking for the badass pilot babes there have been i'm proud to say i mean yourself included a lot of badass pilot babes on this show so i will send you some names of some awesome. former guests uh which uh yeah i mean a plane lady just showed up in the chat she might be on your board she's building an <laughs> rv10 also savannah rasky uh who's a future f-35 pilot i think she just posted a video i think she's just finished her her ots so she's on the way to uh to literally being a stealth fighter pilot so we we caught her here first so lots nice. of cool people we can get get on your show hopefully for you i'll we'll do the bleepy bloops and and connect but awesome. i'm excited I, to, I haven't i haven't listened to the episode today yet but i do generally just think like good like obviously you are a very good interviewer because of your uh your your writing experience and i think that gives you kind of an unfair advantage on the podcast if i if i can gush a little bit i'm just really impressed with it so well thank you it's it's been a lot of fun and i actually am shocked at like how good it came out for the first one because like technically like i i i think i told people that it was a 30 minute podcast and I averaged that it probably, I think I estimate it took me 60 hours of production and editing for that 30 minutes because I was learning everything for the yeah. first time. And it was like, how does this technology work? And, and then like messing up and having to redo it. So I think this second one only took me like 15 hours. So I'm getting better, but um, yeah, it's, it's just been so much fun. So technically I think it came out pretty good and content wise, I think it's pretty good. It's fun. It's sassy. It's inspiring. It's um, just, just, it's all of those things and so uh, people have really i've gotten some great feedback which warms my heart for sure and well it's like what you're doing this is a labor of love i mean this this is a lot of work and you know you put yourself out there and you're like oh my god what what if what if it sucks and what if people like it or what if i bomb or but you know what i'm just like whatever i'm just gonna keep getting better and like you were saying like you know, you start out and you just kind of build and you start networking and people start hearing about it. It's not like you you wake up one day and you have like 10,000 people listening to your podcast. It's just I bet you will, though. I bet well. we, I bet you will, though. I mean, I, I think uh, the, the, the fun just like this is kind of a I should put this on a podcast platform. People keep asking for me to do that. I should do that. Like, I think personally, like, uh, well, there's two things I wanted to say and then we're going to play a game. Um, one is the technical side of it. You were saying like, oh, like it took me six hours, no, 15 hours. Uh, we just wrapped up season one of a podcast for a client of ours at my company. And even with 
like professional editors and professional audio mixers and stuff, it was still like 10 hours per episode. And it, these were about hour, hour long, at like 45 minutes to an hour long episodes. And so like, it's like all that post-production time. I think people don't realize, I think I was joking with you before the show. I'm like, the reason I like live is because it's done. <laughs> like for better, for worse, whatever I do, if I burp or fart or whatever on, like it's all like for, it's, it's there. And I just, I get to move on. Um, but two, like the other thing is like, you're going to fall, like, uh, you're going to find your rhythm with it, obviously. Like, just like you're writing, I, th- I would imagine. I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm don't. i not a professional writer, but, like, you're going to fall into, like, a rhythm with it, and it's just going to be – it's just going to be fun. Like, the, the anxiety, for me at least, like, I think – actually, Sarah Nizzler's in the chat, right? She was, I think, ep- uh, episode two of this show, and I was freaking – I was sweating. My glasses were fogging up. It was a big thing. <laughs> this is like, you know, you're going to – Sarah has that fine. effect on men. She has that effect That's on men. That's true. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing is I. That's why I switched to contacts because I didn't want to fog up my glasses tonight. <laughs> um, anyway, all right. Can we play a game before we wrap yes. up? Yes, I love playing so, games. Yes. All right. This game is called Short Final. Uh, it's not. It's not a, there are no hundred miles an hour spin around the numbers. <laughs> yeah. There we go. No. So it's a minute on the clock. We're just gonna bang through some questions. Uh, a lot of them are kind of repeat questions. There are no points. You've already won. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, Canyon. K- I just looked at the chat. Canyon cases. This this week's game is short glide final. Smart glide. Smart glide final. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So we're going to play some music. We're going to play this game. Um, I'm going to help. <laughs> you're fine you're fine it's just, now it's after 9 30 all the kids have gone to bed we don't have to um short final auto i don't know you guys whatever okay let's play the music here Boom. okay i'm gonna put the get the oh i can't click it i can't click it oh come on computer okay there we go beth first things i gotta know what's your favorite airport you've ever landed at pine mountain lake what about the favorite airplane you've ever flown the laser. I bet. Uh, everyone's going to get mad if I don't ask it, so I'll ask it right away. Track up or north up? Huh? Like in your GPS. Is it north up or track up? I don't have GPS in that plane. It was very bare bones. <laughs> How do you hold <laughs> I don't your... know what you're talking about. How do you hold your sectional? All right. All right. Uh, what about favorite aerobatic maneuver you, you did? Hammerhead. That was, see, I've only done once, but that was my favorite too. I think that something, I don't know, we can talk about it later. Um, lastly, favorite passenger you've ever flown with? My dad. He was my first passenger that ever flew with me. So that was pretty special. That's awesome. So I want to ask you more about the hammerhead here. <laughs> okay. Why for you? Why for you? Because for me, I like it because it doesn't make me want to puke. But why for you? <laughs> What I like about the hammerhead is, and especially in the aerobatic glider, is when you do a hammerhead, you go straight up vertical until you just, until you run out of energy. Like literally you kind of come to a stop and you almost are like suspended in midair. And at that moment you pivot around the CG and you just do, and then you go back straight down. And so there is sort of this otherworldly feel of like zero G where you're sort of in that motion, like you're suspended motionless for that split second before you, you know, go screaming back down to the ground. And what was like super cool doing it in a glider is there's no engine. And what's mm. really weird about a glider is it sounds like a boat, like a wooden boat, you know, like the creaking sound of a wooden boat. That's what it's like in a glider. And so when you go, all you hear is wind. You don't even wear a headset. It's just, you talk to each other. And so it's pretty quiet, but when you go up in the glider and you do that hammerhead at the very top, that split instant where there's no motion, it's like the world is suspended in silent animation and it's just like the root it's the coolest sensation on lots of different levels so that's kind of why i like the hammerhead especially in gliders that's a much more nuanced answer than mine (laughs) spoken by a person who's actually done it more than once so (laughs) i i will say i did i did have the luxury of doing a glider flight and i think I'd never made that connection to the boat thing, but you are absolutely right. 
Yeah, it creaks. It's and it's not. I don't think the the glider is wooden. Actually, I mean, I don't know. It's like probably fiberglass, but it's that creaking noise. That's that's all you hear. Is and of course in an aircraft, maybe there's creaking noises in it, but you don't freaking hear it over an engine. You know, exactly right. like the only sound you hear. So uh, that was kind of an interesting observation. I would have never. But yeah, well, and then there's no yaw. You know. It, we, well, we don't need to get into, but at the top of a hammerhead, you have the, you know, the propeller spinning, so it wants to turn. So you have right. to like correct with rudder, but in a glider, there's no freaking propeller. So it's a very different maneuver kicking over the top in a glider because there's no spin. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah the torques, yeah, I, the torques. Oh, the torques. I, for me, my goal, I think with all this stuff, especially after talking to you, is like, I want to be uh, in the position someday to learn what I would call a uh, gentle person aerobatics like i just want to be able to do like little loop-de-loops some hammerheads you know whatever just the kind of thing that uh i could impress my wife with there's no reason why you can't just go out there and you know you, you find like a great lakes find some like open cockpit kind of thing and just go mm, out and just like talking. so the first time i flew in a great lakes i had this bright idea to wear like a white scarf like this romantic like you know like aviatrix thing from like the old yield timey days i didn't anticipate that once the um engine started spinning and the fan started blowing the the, the scarf like started wildly blowing off <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to like, and it's whipping me in the face. So I had to take it and I had to wind it around my neck and like shove it down my leather jacket. So if you do fly in an open cockpit airplane, I do not recommend wearing a scarf. Even though that's what you see in all the pictures. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it just like blows like nicely in the breeze, but that's not what happens in real life. Just saying. Yeah, well, that's the movies probably. Or but no, like a, like a decathlon or a Citabria, just go get, you know, some fun little, you know, even cubs, you know, just find some, a, a, a Cessna Aerobat, you know, you can just find something fun and not like burly and scary, like a pits or an extra rrr, monster planes, you know, just find something kind of, kind of a bit more docile and go out and have a little bit of fun. Don't let the like air camp that. combat guys take you out. Go out no, some, I, I, well, yeah. I want to go back and do that again now that I'm a pilot. Maybe I won't puke anymore because I'm used to it. Like I, I did that before I had any, any air bad, any any airplane experience. Anyway, uh, we could talk all night, Beth. I'm so happy to have met you at Oshkosh. I hope that we continue to to keep in touch and chat. And I can't wait to see what you do with the podcast. And uh, obviously, uh, I've got a stack. I don't know if I could, like, literally, like, I keep all of my, I've, like, I've literally got, like, a stack. It's just, like, sport aviation, sport aviation. It's, like, I just have all of them. <laughs> I, I feel bad throwing them away. I'm sure that your work is in, oh, that's AOPA. We don't like them. I don't know. We're not talking about them. <laughs> uh, like, sport, like, you're probably in here. I don't know. Did you contribute well, to the March 2018 episode? one I'm yeah sure yeah there. yeah yep. i'm sure you're in there so i think that actually might be if that's the one with the yellow cub on the cover that might be the one from the mac mesa colorado hawk kids oh it's got a it's got a mosquito uh okay well it's, it's in the neck of the woods of that that year and yeah. month Wait, time of year so there's a yellow but cub on it this is really good a... tv this is really good tv we're gonna find oh hey wait <laughs> look at this i got it right there <laughs> Well, I just want to say, Ryan, I really appreciate you reaching out to me on Instagram. And, you know, I just started my badass pilot babe Instagram account. And I think I'm like up to like 250 like followers. So I'm like super excited. So, you know, again, you have to start somewhere and you reaching out to me and like sort of sharing stuff and asking me to be on the show. I really, really appreciate it. And again, I look forward to, you know, continuing to collaborate and connect and, you know, spread the word. I think it's uh we're doing God's work here. We're doing God's work here, right? Some someone's work. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, everybody else, thanks again so much for watching tonight. Uh so great to uh kind of uh I was trying to make another like a, another church metaphor, but it escaped me. But it's great to have the Church of Aviation. I don't know, it's not working. Uh <laughs> But it's great to have all of you in the Sky Fam, in the squadron, uh, here every Wednesday. I, I say it every week, but I mean it. It's like the best part of my week is connecting with all of you about airplanes. Just uh, We have such a great community, and it's so cool to see you all. Um, yeah, we'll see you next week on Super Arrow Live. Beth, thanks so much. I'm always bad at wrapping these things up. <laughs> we, Beth, 
I can't wait to see you again soon. Uh, everyone look for Beth's stuff. She's awesome. Everyone else, we'll see you next week. Uh, Super Arrow Live. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.